if you're a business owner, there's going to come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system when, with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you, it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. This is the Smart Passive Income Podcast with Pat Flynn, session number 203. Here we go. Let's get the party started. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he always chews three to five pieces of gum at the same time. I do that too. And do you split it up uh, evenly on each side of the mouth, like half of it over on the left side and half of it over on the right side, and then you kind of work the two pieces together, merge them, and then split them up again? Sorry. I'll get back to it now. Pat Flynn. Job searches can feel like they're taking forever, a real slog. So stop searching and just match with Indeed. So ditch the busy work, use Indeed for scheduling, screening, messaging, so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. If you want to hire fast, you need to go where the talent is. You can get unparalleled access to job seekers with over 350 million unique visitors globally, according to Indeed data, and an extended reach through Glassdoor. I love how adaptable Indeed is uh, as well, whether you're hiring one person or you need lots for a scalable project, like hiring platform that lets you schedule and interview hundreds of candidates in one day, like there's no other one that you would wanna use. So join more than three and a half million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30 day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. 
Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. Hey, everybody, what's up? Welcome back to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, or maybe this is your first time listening. If it is, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited because we're bringing back a guest who's been on the show before, back in episode 130. He is the author of Booking Yourself Solid and the brand new Wall Street Journal bestseller, Steal the Show. And I love the subtitle of his particular book here, uh, his new book. It's called Steal the Show, From Speeches to Job Interviews to Deal Closing Pitches, How to Guarantee a Standing Ovation for All the Performances in your life. And I, I just love that because we do go through a lot of performances. We have a lot of interactions in our life. And if you can command those conversations or those interactions, and by command, I don't mean you boss people around, but what I mean is you're in control. You know where things are going. You can say the things you need to say to get the, out, the output that you want. Um, and getting your audience to take action, for example, is, is one example of many sort of, sort of these interactions that we have, not just in business, but in life too. If you know how to do that, I mean, you have a huge, huge advantage just in life in general. And Michael Port is somebody who I've looked up to for a while now. I've been a part of his uh, speaking program called Heroic Public Speaking. And I, lo I love that it's called that because it's, uh, you know, there's purpose behind it. Heroes have purpose. They help serve others. And that's really what he's all about. And he brings that to today's episode because he wants to help all of us out. Uh, so without further ado, I'm just going to introduce Michael Port here from michaelport.com and author of Steal the Show. Here we go. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me today. I am so happy to welcome back Michael Port to the SBA podcast. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. How, how have things been going? I hear there's a lot going on. You have a new book, and now you're going to get married in like a week from the time that we're recording. Just congratulations. Thanks. On you know, they, they say when it rains, it pours. In this <laughs> case, all the pouring rain is just what I've been waiting for. So I'm super grateful. Really am. Well, we're grateful for having you back on the show. We're going to talk about your new book, Steal the Show. And the last time we talked about your other book, Booking Yourself Solid, and how to really present yourself in the, in the best way to kind of maximize the amount of money you generate through consulting, through just putting your message out there and actually showing what you have to offer the world. And in the same way, you're kind of taking that in your next book, Steal the Show, to the next level. Because I, I love the, the title of it, How to Guarantee a standing ovation, or so the subtitle, How to Guarantee a Standing Ovation for All the Performances in Your Life. What does that mean? What are, what are all the performances in our, in our life? Sure. So if you think about the quality of your life, it's in large part determined by how well you perform during life's high-stakes situations. So a job interview is a high-stakes situation, a negotiation, a sales pitch, even meeting your future in-laws for the first time, it can be a high-stakes situation. It's not just about public speaking on a stage in front of an audience, but we find ourselves in so many situations where the spotlight's on us and everybody's looking at us and we need to perform. But if we fall flat during those types of situations, then, you know, not a lot of really good stuff happens. But if we feel comfortable, if we feel like we can own that room and we can shine, then I think you know, we really improve the quality of our life. Right, and we're not just talking about a physical room that you're in with people. We're also talking about the room we're in with our audience or potential audience that we have online too, right? Oh, of course, absolutely. So, I mean, we find ourselves in so many different performance situations now. Of course, some of us do things like this, podcasts, but we might find ourselves on Skype calls, webinars, videos. Mm -hmm. There's so many different things where we're called upon to perform. And, you know, this is my sixth book, steal the show. And I really, I really said after the fifth that I was not going to write another book. I was sure of it, 100%. And I said, listen, just if I even say that I'm going to write another book, punch me in the face. Mm -hmm. So I got, I got hit a lot when I said I'm going to do this book. But when I look back at my life, I realized that my success in large part has been a result of my training as an actor. I have an MFA from NYU's graduate acting program. 
And I spent three years there. And then I worked professionally after that. I did shows like Sex in the City and Third Watch, All My Children, Law and Order, mm -hmm. 100 Center Street. I did a number of films, uh, Pelican Brief, Down to Earth, et cetera, et cetera. And I did a lot of voiceovers. Voiceovers was my bread and butter for years. And I quit in part because I wanted a lot more to happen a lot faster. And I was young and I wasn't really willing to take the time that it sometimes takes to do big things in the world. Not everything happens in an instant, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And then I went into business and the fitness industry and I talked my way into a job for which I was completely unqualified. Now I told them I was unqualified, but I made my case and I said, I told them why, you know, I think that they're looking for the wrong person and why I was the right person. And they took a gamble on me and I was really lucky and I worked my way up. And then, of course, you know, 2003, I went out on my own, started a consultancy, and that led us to this point today. But if I look at, I look at all the different things that I've done, each one of them is called for some kind of role playing, some kind of character development that was based on a particular part of my personality. Because I think there's so much more to us than just one thing. And I think we get stuck sometimes in the idea of who we are. So we wrap ourselves up in layers of persona. And that persona is what we project out into the world. Mm -hmm. But it may actually constrain us, may actually hold us in. So the first chapter of Steal the Show is called Finding Your Voice. The truth is what what you discover in that chapter is that your voice is already there. Sometimes it's stripping away these layers of persona that allow you to stand for something in a significant way. And then if we can learn how to play the right roles in any given situation, instead of letting other people cast us in the roles that they want us to play, well, then our voice just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And you can do this intentionally. You can let your voice out in a much bigger way. You can play the right roles in different situations in a much more intentional way and focus on results rather than approval. Mm. Be because if you think about performance, what, 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 what's everybody so afraid of? I mean, you know, there's this, there's this myth, this mythological study that's out there somewhere in the ether that says that public speaking is the number one fear and death is the number two fear. Well, I've not, I've yet to meet anyone who's actually seen this study. <laughs> we and always yet, talk about it. It's so funny. Yeah, we always talk about it. And we, I've also, I've never met, I've never yet met someone who said, yes, I'd rather you kill me now so my life is over forever than give a speech. I've never met anybody who would choose death over giving a speech. But I really get how anxiety provoking it is because I get nervous too sometimes. And I think there's only one reason that we get anxious about performing in front of others. And I think it's the fear of rejection. Other people laughing at us, telling us that we don't know what we're doing, that we really shouldn't be up there or what we're saying is not new in any way. And otherwise, I'm not, show, not so sure what would be scary about it. So that's the big question. The big question is, what's more important to you, results or approval? And if you go into a performance situation looking for approval, you tend to water yourself down, to play it safe. Mm -hmm. And the performer needs to take risks and they need to amplify what is most compelling about themselves to reach the people in the audience? Because it's never about the speaker, ever. It's never about the performer. It's only about the audience. Right. No, I, I completely agree with you with that. My question is, and I'm trying to get in the heads of my audience here, especially those who might still be a little bit afraid of getting in front of, an, uh, of a crowd or even in a, in a small setting, trying to sell themselves in one way or another or share a message and try to convince other people. I think there needs to be some sort of balance in terms of, well, how, how do you balance trying to be someone you almost feel like you're not mm. when you're trying to share this message, when, it, when you know that it's something that could be helpful? Sure. So good performance is not about fake behavior. Good performance is authentic behavior 
in a manufactured environment. And most of these high-stakes situations are pretty manufactured. Giving a speech on a stage in front of other people is manufactured. Uh, Going in for a job interview is very manufactured. So these situations that we find ourselves in are uncomfortable. So we're not trying to be somebody else. What we're trying to do is explore the different parts of ourselves that would allow us to excel in that particular situation. Uh, I'll give you an example. Here's how you focus on results rather than approval. The legendary hockey coach, Herb Brooks, coached the U.S. Olympic men's hockey team in 1980. And at the time, professional hockey players did not play in the Olympics, not for the U.S. at least. They did for the Russians. They snuck him in there, but not for the U.S. Mm. And he had all these young college kids that he was hoping to put together into a strong team that could go play the Russians and the, you know, the other countries. But the Russians were the scariest, biggest, meanest hockey players in the world, and they'd never lost a game. So nobody really took these college kids too seriously. But Herb had an idea. He thought, well, if I can put together a team that works well together and will work harder than anybody else, I think I can beat these Russians. But he had a problem, and the problem was his personality. He was known as a pretty affable guy when he coached for the University of Minnesota. But he felt that if he was going to coach this hockey team, that he had to create another character based on another side of who he was. Because most of those players that he was going to coach didn't like each other. They came from rival schools. Mm -hmm. So he figured, I need them to hate me more than they hate each other, so they bond. And I need to work them harder than they've ever worked before, so that when they do play the Russians, that adversity won't seem so bad. So he created a role that still is based on one part of his personality that was relentless. A drill sergeant to the nth degree. And he did not get any approval from his players. And he did not get any approval from the Olympic Hockey Committee. They were not happy with the way that he was choosing the players, the way that he was coaching the players, the way that he was having uh, their schedule set up, you know, for games prior to the Olympics. But you know what? When he brought that team to the podium and they held up their gold medals, he got a lot of approval. But he needed a lot of courage to go for results over approval. And that is what the performer does in all aspects of life. They focus on what they want to achieve and they make big, strong, bold choices that they believe will get them to that goal. It doesn't mean they will always get there, but people who make strong choices are compelling. They're interesting. They're the kind of people that I want to play with. Mm. And without bold actions, you're not going to get those big, bold results that we're always looking for. And exactly right. I, I have to say that um, that hockey game, I watched that in full. And it's it's one of the few times where I watch a sporting event and I literally get goosebumps uh, because there was so much at stake, much more than just a sports scene. But it was the whole, you know, USA versus Russia politically yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Well, the, the, yeah, the implications of the game had you know, global uh, economic, global yeah. socioeconomic. I mean, it was a big, big deal. And it, there you just said it, the stakes. So the way that we prepare for different situations depends on how high the stakes are. So if the stakes are low, it's not really a big deal. I don't think you need a lot of preparation. But if the stakes are very high, then I think we need more preparation than we typically give ourselves. One of the things that we often get pushback on is rehearsal. We ask people to rehearse and sometimes they push back. Mm. And they will often say that they don't like to rehearse because they think it makes them stiff, that they're better if they're just wing it on their feet and that they've tried rehearsal and that it doesn't work. And I think that they, they're right. I mean, the way that they're thinking about it uh, is right. They tried rehearsal and it didn't work, but the reason it didn't work is because they only did a little bit of rehearsal. If you do a little bit of rehearsal, what happens when you're actually performing say giving a speech, is when you're in that performance, you're trying to recall what you worked on during rehearsal. And as a result, you're not in the moment when you're speaking. Mm -hmm. So you get stiff. 
and actually seem inauthentic because you're not natural and able to connect with the audience. However, if you've done enough rehearsal that you can, quote unquote, forget everything you worked on so that you can allow it to come to you naturally in the moment, then you have authentic spontaneity. And to the audience, it feels like it's happening for them for the very first time, meaning this experience has only happened once and it's happening in that moment. So preparation, when it meets improvisation, will produce authentic spontaneity. And putting together some slides and then running through your slides in your head a few times before you go to give a presentation is not rehearsal. So most people don't know how to rehearse. That's the second objection that we get. And of course, how could they? It's not something you learn in school. I learned it because I got a master's in acting. That's what you do. You rehearse. And the rehearsal process is a messy process. Most of what you're doing in rehearsal doesn't work. But the performer is comfortable with that. Amateurs, amateurs will rehearse until they get it right. But a professional will rehearse until they can't get it wrong. Mm. Someone said that. It wasn't me. I don't know who, though. But I heard it once, and it really stuck with me. That amateurs will, will rehearse until they get it right. They think, okay, now I have it. I'm done. But a professional knows they're never done. They work till the point where I know I'm not going to screw this up. That's They work and work and work, and then they keep working because they know they've got it down, but they continue to improve because they know it's a living, creative art. So they're never really done. And as a result, they don't beat themselves up as much when moments don't work. So the amateur really gets upset with themselves when they have a speech and moments didn't work, a joke didn't land, uh, the audience was a little bit uh, fidgety during a particular section. A couple of people walked out, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the professional knows, okay, I just need to look at that part of the presentation because I'm, I'm constantly working on this. It's a different way of seeing the world. Right. It's almost like the athlete who is a professional athlete, yet he still gets basic training on his golf swing, for example. Of course. Just because he's not, he, it's just mentally, he needs to keep doing that so that he doesn't have to think about that and he can use his brain power on some of those more important things during the match or during the game or whatever. That's exactly right. I love that. I, and I love that quote. I don't think I'll ever forget that now that you mentioned that because that, that, is, that is so true and I, I love that approach to it. The question I have is how do you rehearse for something like a podcast interview or an interview for a job, something that mm -hmm. you don't necessarily know every single bit and part of it that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a, um, a really great example of how preparation meets improvisation. You know, if you said, hey, Michael, listen, come on the program and talk to me about cooking. Uh, I'd be like, well, if you want a really bad show, sure, <laughs> I can come on the show and talk about cooking because I can improv, sure, and we can have fun doing it, but I'm not really going to be very helpful to anybody that wants to cook something. Mm -hmm. I can put the sandwich in the panini grill, but that's about it. But when it comes to this material, because I have done so much work on this material, I can listen to what you're saying, stay in the moment, and do my best to respond in a way that's helpful, which is different than responding in a way that's rote. Because I'm sure you have a lot of guests who come on the show and you can hear that they're just going through a routine. They're going through a bit. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I, they always do that with those four things. Okay, so here's number one, yeah? And, and that's okay as long as we, we can use that material authentically in the moment so we're not overriding what's actually happening. Oh, I hear that all the time, especially in political interviews because, yes. you know, all the debates are going on right now yeah. and yeah. somebody will ask a question and they'll kind of, uh, I don't know, d defer it or deflect it into something else. And it goes into this thing that, that was obviously prepared beforehand. That's right. And they'll, they'll never actually answer the question. That's right. their goal. So 
what a media strategist will teach po politicians is how to do that, how to not answer the question. What I would do is teach my students how to actually answer the question that you're asked by the host. Because if you don't answer the question that's asked, the audience gets often disappointed because their host is their voice. And the host is asking questions that they believe are relevant to the audience. Now, what you're trying to do is call upon what you know and then apply it to the general audience and answer the specific question at the same time. Same thing is true when you are giving a speech in public. When you take Q&A, somebody might ask a very specific question. And if you only answer that specific question with a very specific answer, the rest of the room might turn off a little bit and wait till the next question to see if the next thing is relevant. What we try to do is we try to hear that question and see what about the answer to that question might be relevant to the entire group. And we address that first and then give the real specific answer to the individual who asked the question. And as a result, you're serving both of those groups. You're serving the individual who asked and the larger audience as a whole. Now, when there's two, ty two types of theater. There's stable theater and unstable theater. Stable theater are plays because there's a script, and if it's a musical, there's a score, and you know what your lines are, and things are going to change a little bit here and there. Somebody drops something, forgets a line, walks in at the wrong time. Uh, the audience, you know, someone has a coughing fit, so you hold longer. Those things will change, but for the most part, it's the same show every night. Street theater and improv theater are unstable. It's different very often. Improv is different more than street theater, but they're both slightly unstable. They change. And Q&A to me is like street theater because you have your bits, meaning if I'm doing a speech on Book Yourself Solid, there invariably be, will be a question about target market. Well, can I have two target markets? And if it's not something I addressed in the speech, then it will come up. Now, you try to address the most important questions, of course, in your speech, but let's just say hypothetically, in this situation, that question comes up. Well, I've had that question, I don't know, 5,000 times. So I know how to answer that question. That answer is a bit, and I don't mean a baboom ching funny bit, <laughs> but it is a bit of material that gives a very specific answer to that question. And if you have lots of those kinds of bits at your ready, you can answer questions in any order at any time in a Q&A and give that individual specific answer and the group something to chew on as well, just like in street theater. Because, you know, if I was doing street theater, that street theater is going to, my performance is going to change depending on a number of factors. How many people are there? Are they kids or, or they, are they adults? What is my setting like? Do I have a lot of space or a little bit of space? Am I allowed to uh, uh, blow fire in this particular area, or is that a hazard and I'm not allowed to do it? So I may change around. So, okay, I'm going to open with the juggling. Then I'm going to go to the uh, unicycle riding. Then I'm going to flip to the hat trick. But in a different night, I might do it in a very opposite way. So you can mix and match and pull out these different bits. And the same thing is true for Q&A. I love that. I think this reminds me of uh, Ramit Sethi, and he calls this his story bank. He has just all these different examples and stories and case studies that he kind of puts away and files away in his brain. I, I, I don't know if he literally has a file for those things. He, he may. He may. Well, but, given yeah, given what I know about him, he probably would. Right, right, exactly. That, that, would, that would make sense to me. Which is a smart thing because he can always provide the best answer and the best example to people's questions on the fly. He just has to go to that file either in his brain or – physically. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I love that. And I've been working on creating my sort of story bank and actually just through all the public speaking I've been doing because I've been rehearsing so much, I can't forget all those things. So when I get up in front of an audience and I get certain questions that have been addressed in prior presentations, it's very easy for me to craft an answer right on the spot that is uh, almost, I mean, if I was in the audience, I'd be pretty impressed because it was, it was structured in a way where it was like, wow, that that was on the fly, but he, he he knew exactly the examples to talk about. And it, it wasn't on the fly. It was something that I had prepared ahead of time. So you're right. It is mixing that sort of 
improv and, and unstable with the stable. And, and, and I guess the follow-up question I have, and this relates to what a lot of people in the audience are doing right now, which are things like webinars, where it is a stable beginning where you have a, a certain presentation or slides you go through, and then you leave it up for Q&A. And then also there's things like Periscope and Blab, where people are live and fielding questions on the fly. Do you have any other specific tips for people who are doing things like Q&A, those live interactions? How do you best utilize that and, and, and get the most out of that time? Sure. One of the things that I find most often in webinar environments or Blab or, or Periscope is much too much time in the beginning that's just filler. Rarely, I mean, I just, I just did a, a webinar with somebody in the first 12 minutes were just a bunch of filler about, you know, vac his vacation and mm -hmm. uh, a couple other things. And it was 12 minutes before we got to any meat for the audience. Now, it's great in the beginning to have some kind of emotional, fun, light connection. There's no doubt about that. But if you're getting on 12 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes into some sort of content driven experience for an audience, uh, then you're going to lose a lot of people. So I think most of us can get right to it a lot quicker. We don't need a lot of blab, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah. At the beginning of a presentation. And we also don't necessarily need to make a huge splash and just blow them away in a matter of seconds. Sometimes we put too much pressure on ourselves and we don't have to start with a story. It's great too if you have a great story that kills, but it's not required. If you start with a story, often the audience will say, okay, here goes the story from the speaker. I'm sure I'm gonna hear something about how he washed his dishes in his bathtub uh, 20 years ago and now he's you know, flying jets. Mm. You know, we, we, we get used to this particular uh, formula and the performer's job is in part to break the rules. People are interested in things that they don't expect. I mean, that's, that's how comedy works. Comedy works when, when the punchline is not what you expected it would be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was, uh, like, uh, uh, she was pretty, she was shapely. She was a man. You don't expect that she was a man at that, you know, when, uh, when it, for that punchline. So that's what makes humor work. And it's the same thing. Uh, in general, in speaking, you're looking for contrast, difference. So just like, you know, if you hear someone who's monotone for the entire presentation, the exact same pace, the exact same um, tone, style, then you get a little bored because you need something to keep you stimulated. You need difference, contrast. So there's a few different types of contrast. There is delivery contrast the way that you deliver that content. And we, of course, can deliver it verbally. We can deliver it with visuals. We can deliver it by having audience interaction. So there's a lot of different things that we can do. And we want to make sure that we're getting all these bases covered in a presentation. There's also content contrast. So we use different frameworks to deliver the content. Meaning, sometimes we use a numerical framework sometimes a chronological, sometimes a compare and contrast framework, sometimes a problem solution framework, sometimes a modular framework, sometimes a story three act structured framework. And then, you know, all we're getting all of these different ways of processing the information because I think our ideas are only as good as our audience's ability to consume them. Mm. Our ideas are really only as good as our audience's ability to consume them. So, you know, you, let's, say, let's say John comes up with the meaning of life. I mean, the actual meaning of life that will solve all the world's problems. There will be no more war. Everybody will be healthy and happy and live forever. But he can't communicate it. He can't get people to consume it. And there might be a hundred different reasons why he's not able to do this. So his idea isn't any good because nobody can consume it. It doesn't resonate with anyone. It's not relevant to them. But if you can get somebody to consume what you are saying, well, then your ideas start to take on a life of their own. Mm. 
So you can get people to think differently, to feel differently, and then to act differently. Do you have any tips for getting people to act? I think this is a big issue that all of us content creators deal with is the people who are on the other end, even those of you listening right now who binge listen and you listen more than you take action. And it's it's mm. very addicting to do that. But how, as a content creator, how can we get our audiences to literally do what we are telling them sure. to do? I think actually ask less of them. And not because we think less of them, but because sometimes when we are giving speeches, we try to cram so much in there that it overwhelms the audience. And we do it because we want approval. We want them to say, oh my God, you know so much. Mm -hmm. Wow, you're so smart. Often you'll see a performance and you'll, you'll, you'll say just that. You're like, oh my God, that, that was amazing. That was, oh, wow, they are so smart. I'm not really sure what to do, but God, they're smart. Then you see somebody else's presentation and you don't think about them being smart or not smart but they focus on one specific idea and then give you a very specific plan that you can use to work on that. And then you can do that. And you go, wow, that was really helpful. I know what to do now. And ultimately, as a speaker, you can't do the work for that student, the person in the audience. That's just not your job. You can try to encourage them, but unless you're a mentor or working with these people for a long period of time, you don't have the opportunity to work with them afterwards. So trying to create constraints in such a way that force people to do the things that you want them to do often backfires. Mm -hmm. And if you ask too much of people, it'll often backfire. I'm on the board of a nonprofit and we had a board meeting last night and they were talking about some ideas for the big fundraiser for the year. And the ideas were really interesting, but they, but they required that people do a lot, like over the course of a week. I remember thinking about, and I, I talked about this last, last night in the board meeting, I remember thinking about the ice bucket challenge, mm -hmm. which was a kind of ridiculous thing. You pour ice on yourself so you don't have to donate to a campaign. It's kind of strange. I mean, that was kind of the point. Mm -hmm. If you don't pour ice, then you give money. But it was brilliant because people love to show off themselves pouring ice on themselves. It was brilliant. I had no desire to do it. I was nominated multiple times. And I just <laughs> gave a check once and said, I'm done. That's it. Leave me alone. Because I had no desire to pour ice on myself and film it. I mean, it's fun for some people, but not for me. I so, ended up doing it. Uh, my, yeah. my kids and I did it together and, and we also donated too. Yeah. So, but that's the thing. So it, it, some people did donate and do it and had fun with it because it became a family thing or a friend thing. And that's what made it work. However, if the people were asked to do anything more than just pour a bucket of ice on their head, they probably wouldn't have done it. It just was one thing. Just pour a bucket of ice on your head. You can pour a cup of ice on your head. It doesn't matter. Just one thing. And sometimes I think we ask too much of our audience. So if I was going to ask just one thing of the people who are listening, just one thing, I would ask them this. I would ask them, next time they have to give a speech, get really, really clear on the promise of your speech. What are you promising to the audience? So for example, at Heroic Public Speaking, our promise is we can help you be a better public speaker. It's 100% guaranteed and we do it every single time. It is life-changing, but it is not something that no one has ever thought about before. You know, your promises don't have to be different to make a difference. Your ideas don't have to be different to make a difference. They just need to resonate with the people that you're meant to serve. So if you get really clear on that promise, then in your work around content creation and storytelling and delivery of your presentations, all of your work is about the delivery of that promise. So you take the focus off of yourself and onto your audience. One of the, there's two ways I think to reduce anxiety around speaking. Number one is to know what you're doing. 
that really helps. That really, really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It sounds obvious, but uh, very few people really, really train in public speaking. You're one of the few people who has really studied and done your work. Most people don't do that. Thank you. Number two, take the focus off yourself. If you're worried about how you look, if you're worried about whether you're going to do a good job, then you start getting self-absorbed and self-obsessed. And the more self-absorbed you are when you're speaking, the more disconnected you are from your audience. One of my clients called me up one time freaking out because she got an interview spot on one of the big morning broadcast network TV shows. And she'd been, she'd been working for this. You know, she'd been lobbying for this for a long time. As soon as she got it, she freaked out. She said, I can't do it. I'm going to suck. It's going to be terrible. What can I do to be good? I said, you cannot be good. I said, you can't go into an interview and try to be good. You can just go in there and try to be helpful. That's the best that you can do. And if you're well prepared, then you can be helpful by delivering on the promise that the audience expects from you. That's your job. And that's really it. So when we, when we, when we simplify it, when we boil it down, ultimately, our job is really quite simple. It's not about giving a good speech. It's not about making people laugh. It's not about being impressive. It's simply identifying what kind of help our audience needs and delivering on it. Now, if we've got those fundamentals in place, if we've if we're able to do that, then, then we can start to turn it into a performance. Then we can come onto stage in a back to the future car <laughs> dressed like Michael J. Fox. You see, but if it's just about the spectacle, then it becomes a gimmick and the audience doesn't know why am I here? Oh, that was fun. But what am I getting? So that's why we always do the first, that foundational work. And then we look at, well, how do we make this a real performance, a show exciting? So people are even more engaged. And we get both of those things. Beautiful. Now, the final question I have for you, and this has been a fantastic conversation, Michael. I want to thank you again for coming on the show. Do the rules for guaranteeing a standing ovation change when essentially you want that standing ovation to be a sale? You're closing people to purchase something from you. Mm -hmm. Does the steal the show rules change? Not really. No. The thing that's important to me is that we're not designing our presentations for ourselves. You see, because we have to balance the need to sell something with the requirement that we deliver on our promise. And whether it's a speech where you're trying to book business or a speech that you're paid for or a sales conversation, there is an inherent promise in every interaction. And we need to deliver on that and focus on our own objective. So we always have two objectives. We have an objective for the audience and we have an objective for ourselves. And if those objectives are out of balance, then we might not seem authentic. We might be a little bit out of integrity. But if they are in balance, nobody will fault us because we all have agendas. I think that most people are motivated by self-interest. When you do good for other people, it makes you feel good. There's some reason that you are doing that. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think when somebody has an agenda and they tell you what that agenda is, it's so much easier to interact with them. What I see very often in sales and in presentations is a masking of the speaker's or the salesperson's agenda. But really what drives all of the intentions of that presenter or that salesperson is the sale. Mm -hmm. But if I come on here and say, listen, Pat, I want people to buy, steal the show. That's why I come and do a podcast. I mean, I love talking to you, but I'd rather just talk to you off the radio and just see what's going on. But I want to come here because I want to sell books. I don't think anybody in the world would fault me for doing that unless I pretended like, no, I don't really care if I sell any books. But let me tell you, in chapter two and then chapter <laughs> three, you know, you'd be like, come on, dude, really? So, it's this openness, it's honesty, it's transparency that people uh, are attracted to, and it's completely fine to have an agenda. 
everybody does. Love it. I think that's going to put a lot of people at ease in terms of uh, to helping them think through why they do what they do and, and how they do what they do. You know, it's okay to sell and it's okay to be a performer and, and, and all this stuff that a lot of us uh, struggle with. And, you know, Michael, I want to thank you again for coming on. Where can people learn more about uh, the book and wh- where can they go get it? Sure. So anywhere books are sold, of course, uh, the books on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, which is really cool. And if you, thank you. If you go to stealtheshow.com, stealtheshow.com, after you pick up a copy, you can get a number of complimentary items. There are video documentaries of master classes. There's also a video documentary of a panel with some of our friends, Scott Stratton, Chris Brogan, John mm-hmm. Janst, uh, talking about the business of speaking. And then there are templates uh, for storytelling, uh, content creation, and a lot more. So stealtheshow.com will give you those. And then if you want public speaking help, go to heroicpublicspeaking.com, heroicpublicspeaking.com. And there are more uh, free goodies there that actually don't require the purchase of a book. There are more videos there and guides and tip sheets as well. I've uh, shared heroic, heroic public speaking before. I have been a part of it. It's extremely useful and so anybody interested in public speaking, I highly recommend that. And also, I have a friend in a mastermind group who had picked up Steal the Show, had gotten the bonus material as a result of buying the book, and uh, was raving about it, raving about the videos and saying they were very useful. And so I just wanted to pass that along to you. Oh, that means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you again soon. Anytime. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Michael Port. Again, you can find him at michaelport.com. You can find his books, Steal the Show or Booking Yourself Solid over at Amazon, or you can go through my affiliate link for Steal the Show if you go to smartpassiveincome.com slash steal the show, no spaces. You can also get the links and the resources mentioned in this particular episode at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 203. Also, I wanna take a quick moment just to thank you. I don't know if you realize this, but you've had, you, the listeners, have made a massive impact on the direction of where Smart Passive Income has gone. Uh, As a result of you, I've been interviewing certain guests that you've recommended. As a result of uh, your recommendations, I've been tackling different topics that are that are of high interest to you. Uh, in addition to that, I created a brand new podcast called Ask Pat, which you may have heard of before. And on that show, I answer voicemail questions from you as well. You can actually check that out at askpat.com. But that wouldn't happen if it wasn't for you. Obviously, Ask Pat, there needs to be questions in addition to my answers in order to make that show a success. And, and I'm so thankful that uh, it's there and, and I have you to thank for that. I also have you to thank for pushing me to create some online courses to help you through a number of the, of the different problems and pains that you might be having with your online business, uh, the, the scaling of it, just even the start and the process of it. Um, even though there's a lot of great free information here via the podcast, I know, and I know this from my own experience as well, courses can be life-changing because you you purchase a course and you are just in that mindset of actually doing that thing that that course tells you to, to do. And I have a number of different courses available to you if that's the kind of thing you need in order to actually finally start getting results and taking action. So I know a number of you have already taken action, which is fine. Like I'm not trying to push these courses on you, but they are there and available for those of you who would much prefer to get that targeted information and the accountability and the handholding through those processes. So if you wanna check out and see all the courses that are available to you, all you have to do is go to smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. That's a page that's gonna continually grow over time as well. So keep checking back, smartpassiveincome.com slash courses. And I look forward to uh, to hopefully seeing you there. I also want to take a moment to thank everybody out there who picked up Will It Fly, my new book. It's called Will It Fly, How to Test Your Next Business Idea So You Don't Waste Your Time and Money. Just a, a deep, sincere thank you for all of you who have helped support that book in any way possible, from a share on social media to buying a copy to buying several copies. A uh, few of you out there who are listening have bought many copies to share with friends and family. I just want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart to see it live for a month and continue to go strong uh, just means the world to me. And uh, you might want to check out willitflybook.com for any announcements related to the audiobook for that as well, uh, which should be going live soon if it is not already. So if you were waiting for the audiobook, uh, check out willitflybook.com and that will give you access to information about where you can get that or when it's coming out. But it'll be coming out very soon if it hasn't come out already. Again, I record these sort of ahead of time, so I have to guess, but based on internal meetings that we've had, uh, 
you know, hopefully it would be live or very close to being live at this point. Uh, but it's going to be really cool because it's not just a reading of the book word for word. It's a lot of things that kind of go out of the book and into my own mind about certain things that I talk about in the book. I also invite a number of different guests who are featured in the book and a few others too to add some more flavor to it. And for those of you who listen to the podcast, that would be a perfect way for you to consume that content. So again, check it out, willitflybook.com. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to serving you next week when we talk to a guy who talks all about snacks and how he's been winning in the snack game and changing the world at the same time. So it's gonna be really fun. I look forward to seeing you or having you hear me because I don't actually see you, but you know, it's kind of like I see you because we're friends and we've been talking for a while. But anyway, I look forward to serving you next week. Until then, keep pushing that needle, keep moving forward, keep doing what you need to do on that next one task that you have in front of you. Cheers, take care, all the best. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey there, and thanks for sticking around to the end. If you're looking for more great shows like this one, definitely give How Success Happens a listen. Another great show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. On How Success Happens, Robert Tuckman features some of today's brightest entrepreneurial minds talking about overcoming challenges and viewing them as learning experiences to create success. The challenges that entrepreneurs face are ultimately what make many of us successful, however we define success, and that's what the show is all about. There's lots of names you'll surely recognize on the show every single week. Just recently, Robert had Nasty Gal CEO Sophia Amoruso on the show and the former CEO of Snapple the week before that, which is really awesome. So listen to How Success Happens right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.